Hello, everyone. This is our uh, first lecture on African American religions um, over chapter one. We um, can start first with the actual justification for slavery, um, which is obviously quite difficult of a discussion for us to have today, um, where we see obviously slavery and racism um, and anything connected to it as intrinsically evil. Uh, but to understand the justification for it, for those that um, encouraged uh, slavery or accepted it, um, we see that the European um, beauty notion of beauty was definitely dependent upon uh, Greek culture with white pale skin. You see that all throughout art, um, paintings, mosaics, frescoes, statues, um, and obviously African Americans having a dark complexion or black skin in comparison, um, that looked unattractive. So just the physical depiction helps explain a little bit. So differences in appearance, um, but obviously um, from the perspective of eventual slaveholders, the social habits, the cultural practices, um, particularly interpreted by Europeans, especially those in England, um, saw Africans as having intrinsically less human value um, and were fitted for hard labor. The English saw themselves as civilized and reason that Africans must be uncivilized by the way that they look, the way that their families are structured, their culture is structured, their social habits, um, and thus they deserve poor treatment. Um, Africans were godless, they were soulless, without souls, heathens, because they didn't even know about Christianity or Jesus Christ. We see um, a biblical justification, this theological justification, a divine sanctioning um, of slavery coming from the story out of Genesis uh, chapter 9, um, verses 20 through 25, where Noah, after the flood, he partook of wine um, from his own vineyard and became drunk. And then his son Ham saw his father Noah naked, and that brought shame upon Ham, and he was punished. He was cursed um, by his father Noah, that his son Canaan and his descendants, who, had, who were known to have darker complexion and skin tone, were to be enslaved. That notion was quoted and seen as justification in the South for centuries uh, to support um, slavery itself. There was, um, you know, no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It goes all the way back to Genesis uh, chapter 9 in the uh, what Christians call the Old Testament um, itself. And there's uh, some depictions there of it. The slave trade, here's a depiction of the slave trade. Um, so Africans being forced, obviously forced, um, out of West Africa, Senegal, Sierra Leone, um, Congo, Angola, this western coast here, um, into the America, South, Central, and North America from the European powers. Um, Europe with Portugal, Spain, and of course um, the English, um, the British Empire as well too. You see the bottom line here, between 1650 and 1860, approximately 10 to 15 million enslaved people were transported from Western Africa to the America. So not just the United States, but North, Central, and South America. Um, so, and you see the map here. The Portuguese, they begin um, taking Africans out of Africa to Portugal itself in 1444. You do have um, documentation of baptismal record to support the first African in the New World having a Catholic baptism. And then slaves really start arriving in um, the United States, what we eventually call the United States in 1619 in Virginia. And then slaves were known eventually to be property for life. It became standard that Africans were property for life and through all generations, um, their offspring to come were to be enslaved as well. So they're not viewed as human beings under the same order as Europeans. Um, so the slave trade, the source of labor, supporting North American colonies goes back to 1619. Um, enslaved Africans hit other parts of New England, um, especially with Boston in the 1630s. 
And then some in New England began trips to Africa to gain more slaves as early as the 1640s itself. The Christianization of slaves, should we um, convert African slaves who knew nothing of Christianity um, to the Christian faith? There are reasons for and against it, as you see all throughout America. Definitely resistance. There were those that against evangelizing slaves. Um, their arguments often centered around kind of fear that efforts would result um, perhaps in slaves thinking for themselves, seeing themselves as equal to their owners. This would obviously lead them to become disobedient and rebel against their slave holders and thus be dangerous. Others argued that they just didn't have the intellectual um, capacity, the capability of understanding the Bible, scriptures, and church teachings and doctrines. Others, um, another concern was that converting slaves could just topple the whole delicate hierarchy of slavery and the whole rationale for slavery. They would challenge slavery itself. Um, the notion of a thinking slave, definitely would that be a dangerous slave. They won't remain content in their state of slavery and subjugation of providing free labor. Um, if you if you took time to convert slaves to Christianity and allowed them to celebrate rituals and, and rites and Sabbath holy days, that would obviously detract and decrease labor time. So that would have lost labor, that would have an economic impact. Um, and clearly this would challenge um, the whole notion of Christianity itself. Um, you know, to see yourself as a slaveholder, um, you'd eventually want to free them because, you know, they would definitely highlight a, a, a duplicity in your, in your Christian faith, holding other Christians in bondage. Um, if you were a slaveholder and you had Christian slaves, you're, you're, um, you Christianize them, but yet they're still slaves. So the dilemma here at the same point, though, is Christ calls followers to, to Christianize, to even evangelize, spread the gospel. So if you're not spreading the gospel to people who've never heard of it, that's being disobedient. So there is that dilemma. There were people who were in favor of Christianizing the slaves, um, bringing African slaves into a proper understanding of, of the Christian God's word. They taught that Christian, that Africans were capable of understanding the gospel if it were presented to them um, in a proper format from European Christians, that they did possess a soul, um, and that conversion to Christianity would not disrupt the system of slavery whatsoever. If they had, um, if they were acquainted with Christian faith, it would actually make them better slaves um, because they would understand the divine plan and their place in it. And they would actually maybe more, be more obedient since um, them being slaves was, was God's part of God's plan and God required obedience to human authority on earth. And then, um, so God actually put Africans under the control of Puritans, under Christian control, as part of God's divine plan, and so they should submit to it. But this, you know, really didn't go well, <laughs> um, because, you know, you, you had to be required to read the written word of God in the Bible and have time to reflect on it. Uh, but obviously slaves were not taught to read and had limited, you know, leisure time itself. They had no control over their own affairs. Um, so this, this initially did not go over too well, especially the Puritan outreach um, to African slaves. The Christianization of slaves in the South um, started with the Anglican church that's a part of the Episcopal English Church, the Church of England, with the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, where they were gaining attention to converting slaves as early as 1701 and 1702. You see some copies of their, their paperwork there. They, um, you know, a proper relationship with God would actually encourage slaves to accept the existing social order of society and culture as part of God's plan for the, just the human community itself. So the preachers of the society, of the society, were supportive. They were sympathetic to the slave system in their actual sermons. The large-scale conversion of both white Europeans and African slaves to Christianity, that really occurs with the uh, First Great Awakening. 
which is in the 1730s and the 1740s. Beginning in the 1730s, the, the First Great Awakening is just a series of these outdoor revival meetings, revival meetings that provided a, a general hope of spiritual renewal um, throughout the country. Going starting from the 1730s and 40s and going till about um, almost 1800. Baptists and Methodist evangelists, these traveling preachers, would talk about the return of God um, in various churches outside and inside. There were about 10,000 Africans joined the Methodist churches um, in the late 18th century. In Baptist churches, they claimed roughly 20,000, it's said. There was a second wave of these religious revivals in the early 1800s with the Second Great Awakening from about 1810 to 1840, that between 1846 and 1861, there are about 200 to 400,000 African Baptists. Um, so great success in the Methodist and Baptist churches. How are they so effective in converting African slaves? Usually there's about six reasons here. Um, these traveling preachers did focus on individual salvation. You have to have a personal relationship with God as opposed to formal strict church power structures that you saw within Anglican preachers, the, the Church of England. Number two, religious individualism, that God worked in the human heart, and that made it possible for anyone to preach the gospel, to understand the gospel. Number three, there wasn't as much focus on literacy that you had by Anglicans within the Baptist and Methodist churches. Number four, the water rituals like baptism, being outdoors, being full immersion, um, that may have allowed the African slaves to make more of a connection with water rituals and spirits in their West African native religious traditions. Number four, the Methodists and Baptists are definitely known to have much more of an emotional worship service and revivals. Um, which just was more connected to the African-based religious traditions and the fiery sermons by these preachers um, that may have gotten a hold of the conscience of the slaveholders a little bit as well, too. The enslaved Africans, um, that again, that, that real strong beginning comes to um, the First Great Awakening and then to the Second Great Awakening. There was a large push for Africans to participate more in the Christian faith. Um, house slaves definitely could participate in church activities and the family prayers. And then the Presbyterian minister, Charles C. Jones, he started plantation missions who allowed for those who live far away from churches to worship on a regular basis. And then he also spread the gospel message using a printing press. He was successful in that regard, too. But however, to conclude this chapter, as Anthony Pitton does, just the notion that, again, not all slaves responded to Christian missionary attempts definitely in the same way. Obviously, the hardships of slavery made some respond to all traditional forms of religion as absurd and adequate, and they just rejected the idea of God or gods, including Christianity. Others found the transition to Christianity in North America to be easy and accommodating, since Christianity did exist in Africa for centuries. Others actually combined Christianity with traditional African practices. Um, they developed religious systems that greatly resembled belief systems such as voodoo and santeria, which we'll talk about later in the course. And others maintained as best as they could their Islamic faith that they had with them in Africa and that they carried with them um, to the New World. So this is definitely a complex, multi-layered religious life that can't just be focused on Christianity. To understand African-American religious experience as it has developed over almost four centuries requires attention to a variety of religious practices and sensibilities. We'll discuss these throughout the course. So this just when we focus on Christianity. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.